Oh, hello there, and welcome to Games Yanks Can't Wake Halloween Special. You just caught me playing a game of Rainbow Islands. As to me, there's nothing much more scary than watching a fat child shoot rainbows out of his crotch. Now, unfortunately, I sadly won't be doing any sort of special cameos this year, you know, any sort of appearances from Wizzle, Dr. Ashton, just as Frankenstein, etc. So, unfortunately, all you've got this year is just me, on my own, and in the dark. Well, I guess this might work in my favour. Sometimes it can be shitty when there's a game you really want. You wait a really long time, it takes bloody years to come. But what about those games that you just don't get to play? They were not released in the US, but places like the UK. many friends But what does this have to do with this song? It's games that yanks can't whack Come on! Work will you please? Will you bloody... Oh! Hello there and welcome back! Now most Halloween specials always seem to consist of either a Friday the 13th or a Nightmare on Elm Street. So this year I'm going to avoid the NES whatsoever and just concentrate on ZX Spectrum and Commodore 64 games. So what's our first game this year I hear you ask? Well let's have a look at the script because I've actually forgotten. It is... Um, Friday the 13th. Bollocks. Well, if it's any consolation, this is a Commodore 64 version of the game. Aptly named Friday the 13th the computer game, yes it is named that, in case anyone is idiotic enough to confuse it with a movie sequel, the game was released in 1986 and was regarded as one of the worst horror movie games of all time. Yeah, even worse than the NES version, released a whole three years later. So the object of the game is you play as one of these five gormless looking dead-eyed morons who have to save ten equally gormless kids on the evil days Jason Voorhees. Except for some reason, rather than give him his iconic movie appearance, they've um, made him look like Simon Cowell instead. So it's your mission to hunt down the horrific Jason Cowell before he murders all your friends and finally comes after you. But Simon Voorhees has an ace up his sleeve and has disguised himself as one of your friends. You know, just like he doesn't in the movies. So you have to root him out. So how do you discover which of your friends is Jason in disguise? Some sort of Voorhees sensor? Crackling radio? Or racing heartbeat when you're near him? No, that would be too obvious. Nope, instead you pick up one of the numerous chainsaws, knives, pitchforks and hammers lying around in the game and brutally attack them yourself. I'm not kidding here. The only way to save them is to try and kill them yourself. So it begs the question, why the hell are they so scared of Jason when they got one of their own mates hacking them up? Heh, <laughs> friends like these, eh? Come back here, you slut. Keep still. I just want to drive this Black & Decker through your intestines to make sure you're not Jason. When you do finally uncover Simon Cowell, he's such a cheap bastard because the attack range of his fluorescent strip light, which I assume is supposed to be his hatchet, you stand absolutely no chance against him unless you've got a projectile weapon or the oversized comedy axe, which I actually thought was a garden hoe for most of the game, in which case he runs off like a pussy. So the combination of Jason nearly always being in disguise means he'll never attack you unless you're attacking first, and when you do have the upper hand, he fucks off. So there's absolutely no feeling of danger whatsoever in this game. Jason bears no threat to you until he's killed all other 10 characters, which in itself if you left the game alone and did nothing would take the best part of 30 minutes to do so. And what does happen when you do finally kill Jason? You just play as another of the 5 characters. So you need to complete the game 5 bleeding times to see the ending. And I'm not even going to go into why the hell they thought having tunes like Teddy Bear's Picnic and Old MacDonald Had a Farm would strike fear into playing the game. And why is your health bar a dumbbell? And the icing on the cake to this game is it took so long to develop, it missed its Halloween release and was delayed until the following December where it was advertised as a Christmas game, so they couldn't even get the right season to release it in. And who was responsible for this train wreck? Domark. 
who you probably know better today as Eidos. So at least they're keeping up their tradition of releasing shite for over 23 years. Alright, Friday the 13th was an obvious choice. So for our next game, let's choose a movie franchise that's had a few games released recently, but you'd be surprised they actually started out on the 8 bits. <laughs> Mention Evil Dead as a video game, and the titles THQ released on the PS1 and 2, Xbox and Dreamcast come to mind. And while they were pretty good, well, minus the first one, which was a bit of a shitty Resident Evil clone, they unfortunately sold as well as a bacon sandwich at a bar mitzvah. So we probably won't be seeing any more until Sam Raimi finally gets his arse in gear and releases Evil Dead 4. So as movie licenses go, the Evil Dead series has sadly been swept under the console carpet. But this wasn't the first time the video game industry had a stab at the movie. Back in 1984, when Evil Dead was only a single ology, I think that's a word, Palace Software, who also published a pretty decent and highly popular Barbarian and Cauldron games, released their own version of Evil Dead, which is best described as that zombie Nazi mode from the Treyarch Call of Duty games mixed with Gauntlet's top-down play mechanics. Oh, and a hint of escort missioning, as everybody loves those, don't they? The object of the game is simple. You play as Ash, obviously, and have to protect your group of friends, who all seem to be clones of you except they're grey, by making sure all the doors and windows in the hut are always closed and attacking any deadites that break into the house. Or if they possess one of your friends, kill them as well. But don't think there's any sort of punishment for killing your mates, as for some reason the power of Christ compels them and they suddenly reappear in the house minutes later for some unexplained reason, thus making the whole protection aspect of the game a complete waste of time. But I'm going to shock everyone and say that for a 1984 movie license, it's actually pretty good fun. It's entertaining, but only in short bursts, and it's definitely not without its flaws. For starters, I was never aware from the movie that Ash was actually escorting a bunch of suicidal emo twats, as it seems half the time they've absolutely no intention of being protected by you, and casually wander around aimlessly, reopening all the doors and windows you've previously closed, and happily stumble into whatever demon is in their nearest vicinity, ruining your day in the process. Now you're probably thinking, that's not too much of an issue, just reclose them again. But Ash's controls in the game are about as stiff as Bruce Campbell's acting ability. For example, he can't move diagonally, and his large hulking shoulders make him a right pain in the ass when it comes to manoeuvring around corners and narrow passageways. And that's not forgetting he's unbelievably picky where he's standing to close said doorway or window, making it an absolute nightmare. So you would rapidly jab the fire button, and the off chance you'll get into action decide to close the door if he's in the mood. But uh-oh, the Spectrum and Commodore 64 only has one fire button, so pressing it for anything else other than a pixel-perfect position of closing a doorway or window results in him using his single-use weapon that rarely ever appears, making you open to instantly being killed by any nearby enemy. And when your friends aren't idiotically opening them like total bellends, they're mysteriously opening themselves anyway. Oh, it's a poltergeist, is it? Fuck off! It's shitty programming! And if that lot didn't get in your tits, the most annoying thing of all, Ash seems to suffer from diabetes in the game, as he's constantly losing massive amounts of energy by simply placing one foot in front of the other. So it's not bad enough that the enemies take off massive amounts of energy, the gas even kills you instantly, weapon or not. But walking? You've got to be fucking kidding me. And the absolute cherry on the cake is this game even tries to kill you in real life by giving you photosensitive epilepsy, putting all this flashing shit on screen whenever you lose a life. But, like I said, for a 1984 game, if you can get round these giant Grand Canyon sized gameplay holes, The Evil Dead is still pretty fun. Just don't expect 70 plus hours of Final Fantasy VII's gameplay from it. You're having much hair left after a go, come to think of it. But if you loved Nazi zombies from Call of Duty, and you love 8-bit gaming, then you'll really dig the Evil Dead. Someone should totally call out Treyarch for plagiarising in this game. I found your secret, Treyarch. I'm onto you. Oh, fun- Oh, fun fact before I go. 
Palace Software had to cancel the ZX Spectrum port to this game, as some genius in their company accidentally burnt it to the B-side of their earlier release title, Cauldron. That's like Microsoft accidentally having the full version of Gears of War 3 on the other side of the Halo Reach disc. Yes, putting a sticker on the cover will totally make it look like you guys did that on purpose. I just can't win with you people, can I? You moan about Friday the 13th, and now you're moaning about the Evil Dead. So how about doing a movie franchise that you'd be surprised ever actually had a game released of it? Mainly because it's not really a horror movie. But it's got horror in the title. The Rocky Horror Show. Or Richard O'Brien's The Rocky Horror Show original TV games give it its full title. Strangely, one of the few games especially made for the Commodore 128. Alright, it's more of a musical than a horror film. Give me some creative license. But before we go into the game, let's have a look at the loading screen. I mean, what the hell's with her eye? She looks like Rihanna having a stroke. Anyhow, the Rocky Horror Show is surprisingly a lot more faithful to the original movie than you might expect. Well, as close as you could possibly get given the source material. But you play as either Brad or Janet, who must rescue the other as Dr. Frankenfurter has turned him into stone by collecting the various pieces of the Demajuice machine scattered around the mansion, then escape before the mansion leaves for transsexual Transylvania. Also while listening to an 8-bit rendition of The Time Warp, the most memorable song from the movie. Most memorable as in without any accusations of homosexuality anyway. Sadly for what could have been a pretty good simple movie license, it's scuppered by some really annoying flaws. The most prominent is how blooming slow the game runs. There was no need to make it this slow. A 1 to 8K machine could easily handle graphics like this a lot faster. And God forbid you have anything else that moves on the screen like the lift. Sorry, elevator, I've got this show for Americans. Or laser beams, which makes the game slow down to a mind-numbing crawl. Then you have the fetching the Demajusa machine parts. Granted, gofring is a large part of many video games, even today. But the fact you can only carry one piece at a time, then have to haul it back to the theatre to drop it off, which can take up to several minutes for a single piece if it's at the other end of the mansion, is incredibly repetitive. And heaven help you if you actually come in contact with one of the enemies, such as Riff Raff or Eddie, he'll kill you on the spot. Oh, I forgot to mention, this is a one life game by the way, so we'll need to start the whole game again from scratch if you die. Them aside, all the other enemies in the game are complete dicks such as this bitch who steals all your clothes. So you need to put down whatever piece you have, waste your time walking even slower to recover them, as it's a well-known fact you can only walk like a crab when you have no clothes on, before you can continue with your tedious fetching. And speaking of Eddie, you'll also need to constantly keep an eye on that temperature gauge on the right of the screen, as if it gets warm it'll defrost Meatloaf, who is an unrelenting fucking bastard who insists on mowing you down with his motorbike on sight. So again, you'll need to stop what you're doing, go to the top floor, pass the lasers you'll need to turn off one by one, and turn the deep freeze back on. This is all set to an incredibly tight time limit too, so you need to make a plan of which demajusa parts to retrieve in order, and pray you don't fuck it up in the process, as even if you do it all perfectly you'll still only make it by the skin of your teeth. And what is your reward for enduring all this torture? One of the cheapest endings in history! I know that computers had limited memory in those days, but all they did was cut the fucking game over screen in half! You are actually given a better reward if you fail! IRONY! So my advice is, leave that rare box copy on eBay, as those price hiking bastards on there deserve to be only pro the rusty tetanus lace chainsaw! Download an emulator and a ROM of the game, and play it on 3 times speed or warp mode, and then you'll have a pretty decent game! And crawling across its face, a plague of insects called the human race. Lost in time, lost in space, and meaning. Happy Halloween!
Oh, and if anyone out there is wondering if there is a British version of A Nightmare on Elm Street release, though technically the NES version is anyway because it was made by Rare, then yes, yes there was. It was released on the ZX Spectrum as Freddy Krueger Live. But I'm not going to review it, because I can't be asked. 